。那我们这场演讲呢，是我们邀请呃 Cost Cup 团队很荣幸的邀请到了 Great Cage， 他是那个 Linux 界的呃一个重要的 maintainer。那请大家掌掌声鼓励欢迎他，谢谢。Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to come. I like coming to Taiwan. This is the number of times here. Um, I'm going to talk about Linux kernel, how we do this, how we create it, um, what we're doing, and how you can get involved, which is very important for a lot of you. Um, some background, some numbers. This is the size of the Linux kernel right now. Um, as of the 3.10 kernel release, which happened about one month ago, um, almost 17 million lines of code, 43,000 files. It's a huge, huge body of code, um, very large. It keeps growing at a pretty constant rate. That's how big it is, it's very large. But the more interesting thing is how big is our community? This is the last year's worth of development. 3,000 developers, well, at least 450 companies, I say at least because I try and count them, some I, I miss. Um, this is the largest software engineering project ever in the history of computing. Um, and these numbers keep going up. About two years ago, we, we tracked the 2,000 people per hundred, and we're about like 300 companies. Um, we keep getting bigger, which is really amazing if you think about it. This is how big this is. So, this is our rate of change last year, from a year ago till today. 10,000 lines removed, added, 6,000 removed, 2,000 modified. That's a pretty good number for a project, right? Until you realize this. <laughs> uh, wait, it gets worse. <laughs> um, we're going faster. So what you, we're used to, the rate of change we had last year, is faster this year. Three years ago, it's faster this year. But this is an interesting number. For the past year, this is what we did 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That fast. Um, a year ago, we were going about six changes an hour. About eight years ago, we were going three changes an hour, and we all thought that was too fast. Um, this is very, very fast. And these changes are not just in the drivers, and not just in the architecture specific. These changes are flat across the whole kernel. The core of the kernel is 5% of all the code. 5% of these changes are in the core kernel. The drivers is about 55%. 55% of the changes are in the drivers. It's flat across the whole thing. So the old software engineering model of if it's, don't, if it's not broken, don't touch it, we keep breaking, we keep changing every single day. And we change all the time because the world changes. If the world is constantly changing, if we don't stop, if we stop changing, Linux is dead. We have to keep moving. This is why we do this. And that's for the year. The last release we did, the fastest we've ever done. Um, I say it scary a lot. Um, that's scary. That's really fast. That's a lot of changes. You cannot keep up with this if you do not pay attention. What this means is if you are trying to keep something out of the kernel and develop along the side, think it's like out of tree drivers, out of tree hardware, you cannot catch up to us. We will pass you by and it just will not work out. Um, these rate of changes are vetted faster and the size of a project is larger than anybody else. Any other operating system, any other company cannot keep up with us. We and because of that, we've taken over the world. It's kind of funny. Um, so how do we do this? Two big things we do this to stay sane. We have time-based releases, and we have incremental changes. And these two things I'll talk about. So about eight years ago, we said, let's do a release every two to three months. And we have, exactly. Two and three quarters months is our average for the past eight years. It's regular, it's clockwork. And this is a good thing, it's short. It's really short. So if you miss getting something into this kernel, you know, oh, three months later I can get it in. So it's very good, it's very predictable. People can build products on it. 
They can plan the release cycles on it. It's very, very predictable. And that's good. That people like predictability, especially when they're using this for companies. So how do we do this? So latest does a release. I'll pick 3.1 as a number. Um, then two weeks, for two weeks, all the developers throw things at Linus. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then he does release candidate one. Release candidate one is great. Um, everybody who, we kind of forgot that there was a release window, sent some more stuff, so we just release candidate two a week later. And then a week later, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then until we have bug fixes only. We start doing bug fix, bug fix, bug fix. And then there's a new release after three months. And then we start over again. This is what we do. This happens every three months, and this is how we do development, how we do releases. We realized this about, well, eight years ago, that we needed something between those three months. What happens if there's bugs found? So we made something called a stable release. So I'm in charge of the stable kernel releases. So Linus does a release, I take that, and I do about a release every week. So I'll do 3.1.1, .1, .2, .3, .4, and so on down the line. The rules for this is the patches have to be in Linus's tree. And that's really, really important. We don't want these branches to ever to diverge. We don't want the stable tree to get things that Linus doesn't have. And we have a real strict list of things we will accept. Bug fixes only, maybe a few device IDs, but no new features. Um, we'll take some performance, speed ups, and stuff like that. But that's how things work. Um, and then another important thing is I throw that away. I drop it on the floor and run away like when Linus does a new release. And that's very, very good. It makes it so I don't have to keep lots and lots of kernels going at once. Um, that was working out well for a while, and then we found out that people like to build products on Linux. So we wanted to make something that was more stable for them. So we made something called a long-term kernel. So long-term kernels, I pick one a year, um, and I'll maintain it for two years. Um, after two years, the number of changes that go into those kernels falls off. So after two years, you shouldn't be using that anyway. Um, 3.0 kernels right now long term, 3.4 is long term, and um, I guess I get to announce now today, the 3.10 will be the next long term kernel. And people build products on this. There's an LTSI project from the Linux Foundation that a lot of people are picking up. Yocto's picking it up, Monaro's picking it up, um, Android's picking it up, or basing it on there. So you can rely on that kernel to be maintained by the community for two years. Security fixes, bug fixes. It's a really good thing. A lot of people are doing this. Oh, Kurt, if anybody has questions, please feel free to ask. So that's how we do releases. Constant, constantly do releases, maintain these for two years. Linus comes out with a new one every three months. That's it. That's it. So what do we do? How do we make a change? So let's talk about this. So we have developers. We had almost 3,000 developers, right? And they make a change to the kernel. They want to write a new driver. They want to fix a bug. They do something. So they take that, and they send the patch. I'll show you about patches in a minute. And they send it through email to the maintainer of that file. So the maintainer is, we have about 700 of these people listed. They maintain like a subsystem like USB, which I maintain, or networking, which David Miller, or such stuff, or just a file, just a specific file. Lots of people own individual drivers, things like that. About 700 of those. They look at it, they review it, they say yes, no, it's good or not. And if it's good, then they'll pass it on. So let's look at what a change looks like. This is a change. So a patch is one we have to break all our changes in the Linux kernel up into individual pieces. Like your old math professor said, show your work. I want to see every single step along the way. You can't just say, rewrite the scheduler. You have to say, change this, change this, change this. And here's one example of one thing. Um, it's a patch written by uh, Robert. There's the author at the top. The subject says it's USB on the go. Uh, a little description, and then there's some signed off bys. So Robert, when he, when he does this patch, he says, um, I agree that this is my work. And I'll talk about that in a minute. David Brunell, who is the maintainer of that, said, ah, looks good. He'll acknowledge it. Then he sends it off to me. I grab it, and I put my name on it. Um, that's an old one. I don't work with Susan anymore. Um, and then here's the change. It changed to we actually look at X before we reference it to fix the bug. And that's it. One tiny little thing. So these are what happen constantly. Nine of them an hour. This is the change. 
So one thing about this is, you see three people's names associated with this one or two lines. In the kernel, you can look at those 17 million lines of code and say, who wrote this line? Who reviewed this line? You can trace every single line of Linux kernel back to at least two people who reviewed it. It's the best audited body of code out there. It's crazy. Um, lots of companies look at this and they wish that their internal companies, their internal developers would do this. So let's say we're using Git now. So you can track every single line of the kernel to who was responsible for it. So this signed off by, if there's a problem with this, somebody can say, hey look, there's a bug here. And I'll say, oh, I'll blame Greg and David and Robert. <laughs> but that's good. So it's personally responsible for me. And you put your name on it. It's not a company's name, it's an individual's responsibility which is a very powerful thing. Both it's good for recognition, and it's also good for making sure you do good quality work. So that's a patch. So a little bit about signed off by. So signed off by is something we came up with a number of years ago, and it basically means this. Um, you created it or it was based on something somebody else created with a proper license, which means it's compatible with the GPL version two, or somebody else provided it to me, and um, it's public. Public is important, and it's not anonymous. It has to be with a real person's name. Or I have to not know you're anonymous. Um, we accidentally take things anonymously, but we fix that later. Um, so I can't know that, I have to know who's behind every line of code. That's what we do. So every bit of code in the kernel uses this. A number of other projects are trying, starting to use this as well. I think Git uses this, um, and there's a few others as well. It's a good, nice little, concise, legal thing. So. All right, so let's go back. So then those files, the drivers, it went to those 700 people, and then they take that, and then they send it off to the subsystem maintainers. Subsystem is like USB, networking, PCI. Um, I currently maintain the serial layer, the USB layer, the driver core, and a few other weird things. So I'm one of those people. We have about 100 subsystem maintainers we're running about now. So all these people send those code up to them, they have a public Git tree that is pulled every single night from uh, uh, in Australia. There's a developer, Stephen Rothwell, pulls those together into the Linux next tree. That's at the top. He checks all the builds and all the architectures. He checks that the merges work properly, and he sends us bug reports. He says, oh, look, the networking stack could, uh, conflicted with a change you made in the USB stack. Guys, work it out. Um, and he does that. And he merges it every single weekday and tests it and builds it. If you want to see what the next kernel is going to be, not the current one, test Linux next. If that's the best thing you can do, test it and let us know if there's any problems. Because that's, all of us can test our own individual trees, but we can't test everything together. Very important. Then there's Andrew Morton, who sits off on the side and he just scoops up stuff for subsystems that don't have maintainers. There's a lot of that. He picks patches that we forgot or I dropped and whatnot. And he pulls them and then that goes in Linux next as well. Andrew does a lot of work that way. It's really good. He's the only person that reads all the Linux kernel managements. Everybody else, we all filter it. <laughs> so that's how we work. Everything gets into there. And then when Linus opens the merge window, like I talked about, we all send it to Linus. Now, Linus doesn't pull it directly. We have to explicitly say, take this, take this. And that's important because sometimes stuff in Linux Next is not working. Like one, a couple of kernel releases ago, the TTY layer, we had some real big bugs. I could not, it would not be good if Linus just pulled it in. So I had to wait a whole kernel release cycle. It's only three months. We were okay with that because we knew it was going to, it was going to be short term. And he didn't pull that. So we all throw him the Linus. He sucks them in, and then the development cycle goes on. And that's how we work. Linux next every day. Linus every two months, three months. Andrew sucks them in. 3,000, 700, 100, up to Linux. That's what we do. Make sense? Questions? Answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll move on. I got one. So let's look at what we did last year. This is always fun um, just to see where a lot of changes are happening in the current. So last year, this is quantity, not quality. <laughs> Anyway, um, I know these guys are great. So this is what one developer did last year, Hartley. 1,900 patches were accepted. 
Now think about that for a second. Our rate of change is nine patches an hour, right? That is the patches accepted. That is not the patches submitted to us. So we review, we reject a lot, they go through review cycles, they get rewritten, they get fixed, whatnot. The amount of code that's coming at us as developers is like double to triple that rate. These are the ones that have been accepted. So Hartley, if he's been cleaning up the comedy subsystem, that's the data acquisition drivers. Um, he works for a tiny company that makes some engraving systems. They work, they need that for Linux. He's been cleaning up the code like crazy, doing a very, very good job. Good quality. Um, Alvero, he's the file system, the virtual file system layer, and the core of the virtual file system. He's been reworking things. Very good stuff. Mark Brown does embedded sound development, so he's been doing a lot of work. Um, Shashin, um, he is the ARM platform maintainer for the one of the one of the chips. I'm not sure which one. So a bunch of work has gone in there. Hans does video for Linux, a lot of media developed drivers. Um, Alex came out of nowhere because of the remote disk driver or remote block device tree finally got pulled in. That was something that's been sitting outside of the kernel for a long time. It got sucked in the past year. So his, he showed up there. Um, Johannes Intel wireless driver. So these are, in, 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 this shows like a lot of places where one, but then the kernel's changing a lot. Takashi Sound, Alexel is an example of somebody who's just doing janitorial work. He goes to the kernel, fixes up bugs, cleans things, Spelling fixes sometimes. People send us patches, that's good. But he's fixing up tiny, lots of little tiny bugs everywhere around the kernel. And that's a really good thing. Alexa does a really good job. And we have a number of other people to do that. So you can do janitorial work in the kernel and still do a lot of it to get good recognition. And then Jingo does the um, backlight and frame buffer drivers for some embedded systems. So that was the quantity that happened. So then I showed the signed off by. So this is the signed off by for the past year. So that's what I do. <laughs> I read code every day. That's all I do is read code. Um, everyone, somebody said, David Miller. So David Miller does networking. Um, David compared the job of a subsystem maintainer to be like an editor for a book company. We read things. We, re we tell you what to do, the writers what to do. We tell them how to revise things. And we're editors. We push back. We accept things. And every once in a while, we get to go work on our own little project. But we're editors. And that's what we do. So I do a lot of USB staging drivers, driver core, David networking, Maro, video for Linux, uh, John, wireless networking, uh, Mar uh, Mark, embedded sound, Linus does everything. Um, this is something interesting. See, Linus isn't sign off by every patch. You notice how we pull patch trees from somebody? That's because we people, um, we work on a web of trust. Linus trusts some of us to get things right. I trust things from other developers. So I will pull some developers' trees, and I just assume that it's right. And I don't assume, when I was talking about trust, we don't assume that you got it right all the time. I assume that if there's a problem, you'll be there to fix it. And that's really important. When you're submitting something big to the Linux kernel to start with, I want to make sure you're going to be around there to fix the problems. We've had some very um, big problems in the past. There's one large networking feature that went in a number of years ago. David Miller accepted it. The next day, that email address disappeared from the web. And it took him about a year to fix all the problems. So if I accept your code as a maintainer, I have to know that I'm, I'm now responsible for this. So I want to make sure you're going to be there. So if you're trying to submit something new for the first time, there's going to be a lot of pushback to start with, because I want to make sure you're going to be here to fix it. Um, that's one thing that makes things harder for us. But it's, we do it for a reason. Andrew Morton, lots of lots of patches, Mark Brown, Ben Sound, Hartley, Pumley. So Hartley, one guy, he didn't sign off anybody else's patches. He did it all himself, and he still made the top ten. John Wireless, uh, Daniel, um, the RM letter, video letter, Johannes Miller Wireless driver. So these are areas of the kernel that are getting a lot, a lot of development. It tells you what's going on. So, any questions? All right, so now who's paying for this work? This is fun. Um, I've been tracking this for about eight, six years now. And for the past six years, it's been very constant that about 15 to 20% of the work on the Linux kernel is done by people that are not being paid for it. It's been a pretty constant number. These are amateurs, number one, and unknown individuals, number six. 
Um, amateurs are people we know that they're not working for somebody. Unknown is I don't know who you're working for. But all those unknown people, they're not doing any more than five inches. Just like a one-off here and then. Um, so that, the problem with Linux kernel development is if you start getting a few patches in the kernel, you get a job. You will be hired. I mean, it is really, really hard if you're a kernel developer not to get hired. <laughs> we need them. There's lots and lots of companies using Linux. So if you do any number of contributions, you'll start getting emails from Google and Intel and lots of people wanting to give you jobs. So if you're a student in school, start doing some kernel work today, we can get you hired tomorrow. <laughs> I mean it. We need those developers. And I talk to a lot of students, and it's really important. Um, because it shows you're working in a community. As an employer, if I see that you're working in a community, you can communicate on email, you're not crazy, um, I can hire you. I mean, that's a good thing. It's a really good thing to work in open source development if you want to get a job. You don't need a resume anymore. Your code is your resume. It's all public. It's a really good thing. So here's who's funding it. Red Hat, Intel, Lenaro has come up a lot. TI, um, Vision and Gravy, that's Hartley, the one guy, number seven. So one guy for one company did that much work. So for companies not to be able to contribute to the kernel, like, oh, it's too hard, one guy. <laughs> it's not hard. SUSE, number eight, IBM, Samsung. Samsung's gone up a lot. Pardon? <laughs> Samsung. Um, here's some more. Google, consultants. Broadcom. Maybe we'll sort of Renesis, Oracle. In, I don't know what any tech storage is um, in Cisco. So that was 400. Those are the people that did that. So the Cisco one is about, I want to say it's like about 300 patches. So anything in that starts dropping off. That's who's funding this. That's who's contributing this work. Intel, IBM, big ones, Google. Um, the Google stuff is nice. That's their server guys. Their Android guys aren't doing that much. They're doing a little bit. <laughs> hey, no, I mean, their stuff is already been merged. It's done. You laugh. It's merged. It's in your phone. Uh, the Android guys aren't doing new kernel development these days. The server guys are. Android stuff is done. So um, it works really well. Um, so it's not a knock on the Google guys. <laughs> I like them. They like them. <laughs> um, any questions about any companies? Anybody want to know? I've got to pull this somewhere. How about the Android code? How about the Android? All the Android code is in the Linux kernel today. It's been there for about a year. Oh. Yeah, it's all merged. It's very tiny. It was only 7,000 lines of code. Your serial driver is three times that big. I mean, <laughs> I mean it was not much. It was not very much. Um, they had some interesting things. They had some new features, uh, but it's all merged. It's all there. It's all not going anywhere. Um, they have some new things coming along. Lenaro's trying to help merge a few other things that's coming up for new devices, um, different ways to do some process communication. But the thing, you can take stock kernel and run your phone today. So that's good enough. Any questions? Oh, not at all. Oh, not at all. Microsoft. Um, <laughs> so, no, okay. So, um, let me give you some context here. Last year, Microsoft was in the top 20 of Linux kernel developer I mean, contributions. Um, they contribute to K uh, the hypervisor, the Hyper-V. They run as a virtual machine. You can get Linux running on Azure, which is their, their um, big cloud platform. The, um, the, the key Microsoft developer um, that does Linux work came from Novell. I know him, KY, very good guy, and there's a few other people there. Um, and they, they do a lot of Linux work. I live in Seattle, where Microsoft is. Um, when the Linux Foundation came out with a report last year said that Microsoft was in the top 20 contributors to the Linux kernel, the local paper uh, referenced that old quote by Steve Ballmer that said Linux was a cancer in society. It said, has, has Microsoft cured cancer? <laughs> that was a local paper. <laughs> that was fun. Uh, um, actually, Seattle has a lot, a lot of ex-Microsoft people doing Linux work. <laughs> uh, it, it is. There's a lot of Linux jobs. I mean, all the Amazon stuff, Facebook, Google has huge offices, IBM, Valve. Valve is doing all Linux work now. 
Um, they're all next to Microsoft people. That's great. <laughs> so, anyway, so Microsoft. Any other questions about companies? Yes? Did NVIDIA founded after Linus' speech? Did NVIDIA change after Linus' speech? Did NVIDIA founded after Linus' speech after NVIDIA? No. No, no, so did, um, did things change for NVIDIA before or after the speech? The NVIDIA stuff is the NVIDIA uh, Tegra, the embedded stuff, and this is not their video drivers. Uh, they have a lot, a lot of ARM embedded, well, that's those guys. I talked to them, I know that they're a totally different division than the, than the video guys. Um, I ran into the NVIDIA closed source drivers at Dow. He was sitting in the corner, he said, oh, we'll talk to them. <laughs> um, I know why they do what they do, that's fine. Um, that's fine. So no, it didn't, and Linus is rightly mad at them. So. Nobody asked about Canonical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Alright. So, product development. I want to talk about this. If you work for a company, this is your normal product life cycle. If you're doing like new hardware, things like that. Time goes on to the, to the right, design, bring up, integration, testing, release. That's a generic thing. I talked to a lot of hardware companies that works. So ideally, this is where you want to do your work, or the kernel. You want to do your kernel, submit your code to the kernel before you integrate it. And then it gets accepted, takes about three months to get accepted and merged, and then it comes into the Linux kernel before your hardware is released. And people say, no, I can't do that, I can't do that. Um, this is what you have to do. Your competitors are doing it. An example, Intel, like two kernel releases ago, we ripped code out of the kernel for a chip that Intel never shipped. It was merged that early. It was accepted that early that nobody realized that the hardware was never even released. <laughs> Intel is that far ahead of everybody else. They know it, and they are doing really, really well. So this is actually Intel is like way on, way left. Um, a lot of companies start doing. The problem is, if you release your code, your kernel submission when the when the hardware is released, you're playing catch up because it'll take you about know, three to six months to get it accepted. By then, your hardware guys are working on the next product, and they're already behind, and you're you're playing catch up, and then it's just lost. You have to do it like this, and there's a reason why. IBM and Intel have publicly said this. It saves you money and it saves you time. So if you work for a business that says, I can't do this, it's going to cost us too much money or too much time. IBM, Intel, huge companies with lots and lots of money have said it saves them time and money. So for you to ignore them means that they will beat you. I gave this talk to ARM, the ARM developers, and they agreed. <laughs> I mean, ARM has a problem there. ARM is very, very late. Their hardware comes out, and then they get around to doing the kernel code. Uh, and they know they need to work on that. That's why they formed Lenaro. Lenaro is doing really well, but they have some work to do. Intel is doing really, really well. So you can do this, and you have to do this if your company wants to succeed. Don't want to make it sad. But, but. So, how do you get involved? I'll point to the individuals. The best thing you can do is run the latest release on your machine. That's the best testing you can do. We need that. If you have a problem, let us know. If you wait to a couple releases to go by, to pick it up from a distro or whatnot, we, we won't remember what we did. Remember, we're doing nine changes an hour. I can't remember what I did last week, let alone last month. I don't remember what I did yesterday, really. Um, so run the latest kernel. If you have a problem, email us. Our emails are there, we know how, we have tools, we have scripts that point, point you to the right person, use it. It's the best thing you can do to get involved. Um, if you want to install a kernel on your machine, there's a whole book that was written, it's free, you can download it. I wrote it, it's okay. <laughs> I don't get it. So download it, it's actually Years ago, I bought the local. There's a, a translated copy. It is in Chinese. I bought it in a bookstore here. Um, and when I bought it, my credit card company called my wife at home and said, "Your card was used to buy a, a very cheap book in Taiwan." <laughs> <laughs> my wife said, "Yeah, that's my husband. <laughs> I can 
travel place to buy one book and then you play. <laughs> anyway, um, it's a free book, it's downloadable online. Uh, it tells you how to build a kernel and install it on your machine. It's gotten really, it's a little bit out of date, but it's gotten really, really easy these days. A number of distros make this very easy. Um, Fedora, OpenSUSE, um, Arch, Linux, uh, Debian, all really, really good distros to get install your own kernel on. They work really well. Um, Ubuntu has little tweaks to it, but um, there's good online documentation for doing that. Um, so it, it can be possible. That's the best thing you can do when you're going to build your own kernel. So then, how to get involved beyond that? We have a whole how-to. Read that. That's just a link to other documents. Um, it's translated into other languages. There's a Chinese translation, a Japanese translation, a Korean translation. Um, the Japanese were first. Three hours later, they came Korean China. Um, the best thing, um, the Japanese translation, the person who's responsible for that file in Japan, he's a very high level executive at a very large company. And he likes pointing to his engineers and said, if I can get kernel patches in the kernel, you can. <laughs> so it's good. So he's in charge. He's a very good guy. Um, and then how do we do this? How? I'll break down in very, very good detail about what I talked about. The development process. It's a really good documentation written by Jonathan Corbett from Linux Weekly News, who I think talked here last year or something. Um, very good. Very thorough. Read those two things. And then if you have questions beyond that, kernel newbies. Um, there's a very good wiki on there that we document what was in every kernel release. There's a mailing list, which is very good. There's no real dumb questions on there. And there's an IRC channel, too. Um, lots of people are on the IRC channel. When I'm not traveling, I'm on there. Um, it's a very strange IRC channel. It's very quiet, unless you ask for something. And then you just do it. It's not for talk. There's like 500 people in there and nobody's talking. <laughs> um, but, but then you ask a question and then people fuck up. Um, and then the best thing about that is there's enough people on that IRC channel that if somebody doesn't know the answer to that question, they know how to find those of us who do. So people will say, oh, Greg's over on this channel over here, go, we go grab him, something like that. It's a really, really good resource. Um, very nice. Um, I wrote, I gave a talk a number of years ago on how to write your very first kernel patch. I think there's a talk after this on how to do that as well. Do that. It's very simple. You can fix a spelling mistake. Submit your patch. Uh, a lot of it is how to get the email client to work, how to send it properly, you know, how to document it properly. But usually the hard part is not the part of the patch, it's everything around it. So once you get that down, you're good to go. That's a good talk. Um, and then how about what to do? I talked at last little about janitorial tasks. There's a list of janitorial tasks and kernel newbies. Um, the whole to-do list, it's kind of a little bit out of date, but it's pretty good. Um, it's a place to start if you don't know where to go, if you don't know what you want to do, if you want to do something. Another really good one is the Linux driver project, which I do. In the kernel itself, there's a to-do file for all these drivers. The staging drivers are really, really bad code. I take anything, it doesn't have to meet the coding style guidelines, it doesn't have to meet the rules, I just have to build, it has to be the proper license. And sometimes that's really hard <laughs> for some of these projects. Um, so look at that, there's a to do list. Take something on the list, send a patch. A lot of those is, oh, clean up the white space. Great, a lot of people start there. A number of people have started by cleaning up little tiny things like this, um, gone on to the other things and now have a job. I know at least 10 people that have done that. So it is possible to start with spelling fixes and move on. Um, and that's great, and that's a really good thing. A lot, kind of sad because they go off to the jobs and they leave this alone. <laughs> but I'm happy with that. So. That's good, and I think, yeah, oh, my penguin picture. <laughs> um, this was taken by a kernel developer, I think, in South America. So, questions, comments? Yes? Um, I heard that you talked about the ARM um, uh, portion of the kernel. And then, uh, because from, from what I see, there are lots of uh, uh, trees maintained by these uh, hardware developers, like Texas Instruments maintains their own trees for OMAP series of processors. Or perhaps all Windows also maintains their own trees for their A10 processors or A series of processors. So what's the ecosystem there? Why are they not? I 
Okay. So why does the ARM developer or companies maintain their own trees and not work upstream? Um, if you look at that list, Lenaro, very high up. Texas Instruments, very high up. Broadcom, very high up. Um, Marvell, no. Qualcomm is interesting. Qualcomm hides their contributions. Only company I've ever seen that. They hide it in weird shell companies. Um, but they all are directly involved in the Linux kernel development process. They have their own trees separate um, for their products. And they do development before they get into things. Um, Texas Instrument has been merging almost all that back up. Qualcomm has been merging all that back into the tree. The ARM developers community in the past year has done really, really good things. They are now a huge contributor to the kernel. They are integrated properly and they're working well. There's a huge subtree way of sub maintainers and sub sub maintainers, and the bell patches flow between us very quickly and very easily now. So that has changed in the past year, year and a half. Um, so they are better, and they're working really well. So um, they have a ways to go, but a lot of them are doing really good. So they are there. So they know that. They have to. Otherwise, they can't keep up with that rate of change. Other questions? Sir? So the problem is Linux TTY um, terminals native console can't do um, Unicode. They can't do UTF-8. Um, we are changing that by ripping it out. <laughs> um, about, um, the VT layer, the virtual terminal layer, is being ripped out of the kernel and entirely so that you can do the whole console layer and the whole layer from user space. And it's, uh, it ties the user space to the kernel very tightly a little bit better, but then you get full Unicode support and you get better font support. And it was a Google Summer of Code project last year, and it's been almost all merged, and the patches are working. There's a few external patches today, but that is almost finished. Because we realize that is a problem, and, um, it's, and it was neat that we fixed the problem by moving, ripping code out. <laughs> so yes, that will be. Yes? <laughs> I think many of us of the Taiwanese we are seeing we think Samsung is our competitor. So would you please tell us about the contribution of Samsung and um, winning <laughs> <laughs> um, Individually Samsung only cares about Samsung. And that's okay. Um, Intel only cares about Intel. IBM only cares about IBM. Um, what all the individual companies, when they contribute, they only care about their own stuff. Microsoft only cares about Microsoft. And that's good, because the changes that Samsung does benefit you. They do. They did a lot of work on some of the DMA layers, and they did a lot of work on some of the button layers of the kernel, and got it merged. And the memory subsystem Samsung did, I know I work with these developers. I've been traveling to Korea a bunch. Um, and you benefit. So their work makes your devices work better makes your chips work better. So that's the way Linux works. Everybody contributes only for what they care about, but it benefits everybody. So don't be afraid of Samsung for the kernel work. But every company is that way. So you shouldn't be afraid of Intel, you shouldn't be afraid of IBM in reference to the kernel work. And that's a really weird thing. So all these companies like Red Hat and Sousa and were all competitors, right? I worked for Novell, Sousa a long time. And it was funny to watch people play with different companies off each other, not realizing that we all knew each other and we all talked on the IRC channel together. <laughs> so we'd have a customer come to us and say, oh, they said Susa did this to Red Hat, and Red Hat say, and they'd do the same the opposite to us, and we'd go, we talk to each other on IRC, we're like, no. Yeah. Um, but that, it makes it very hard for managers and engineers and um, vice presidents to realize that Red Hat and Susa share an engineering team. <laughs> um, IBM, Intel, and Samsung share an engineering team. ARM and Intel and HTC, you guys all share engineers on the Linux kernel, and that's okay. That's, that's fine. That's, that's good. It's contributing because you're making your own company's stuff work well, and it benefits everybody. And it's a very, very strange thing. It's a very weird thing to get managers used to, um, to get companies used to. Um, personally, I mean, I never thought you'd Taiwan talking about this kind of stuff. Years and years ago, I started programming. 
It's a very different development model. But we've created something that nobody else has ever been able to create because the model's so different. So don't be afraid of Samson now. <laughs> be afraid of Samson for other reasons. <laughs> no, their engineers are great. No, they're nice guys. And one In front, yes. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that. Okay. You mentioned that some of the arms uh, attribution wasn't really integrated because they didn't submit it. Uh, and you said that eventually they have to catch up. But that, I think, is uh, relying on one assumption that the mainstream will evolve so fast that they cannot catch up, or they, so, so, right? But we have seen that some of the open source projects couldn't catch up. I mean, couldn't move fast enough, and they lose the edge eventually. For example, uh, Apple's work on a few things like WebKit versus HTML. Okay, so how, uh, what made you think that Linux will not end up like that? And another thing is, uh, since the uh, kernels and uh, GPL, why can't why can they you know keep their contribution hidden? So two questions. Uh, okay, I think the second one first. GPL. The Linux kernel license is a GPL. That means anything you ship has to be released. That's the law. that's the rule. Binary kernel drivers are illegal. Um, they are. Um, binary, but not only that, they are technically very very hard to do. Because that rate of change is really, really hard to make a binary kernel driver, you have to spend a lot of money. NVIDIA dumps a lot of money into keeping a binary driver. And also, it's very hard on a technical level, and it's very hard on a moral level. Morally, how are you to say that your tiny driver for your tiny little piece of silicon is somehow more important than the 17 million lines of code that you're relying on? It's just a moral thing. So that's that. All right. So, um, Keeping ARM code out of the kernel. Um, they know they can't do that anymore. And they're working really, really hard to do that. They are behind on some very development, but they're getting better. But how do we know we're going to keep succeeding, right? I look at these numbers every day, every year. I keep these numbers every release. I'm worried that if these numbers start to go down, then we might have a problem. But we are going so fast that these numbers can be cut in half. And we're just going back to the rate of change that we were doing four years ago when we were still taking over the world. Um, but because we're doing so well, the thing I worry about, the only thing that can ever hurt Linux is Linux. Seriously, it's up to us to kill the project. So my goal is not to do that. I really worry, all the kernel, all the core people, we really worry about that. We want to make sure it succeeds. We want to make sure it runs on everything. We want to make sure it works for everybody. So we talk to people. That's why I travel so much, that's why I'm here. I want to see it succeed, and all these companies really want, and they're paying us to do that. So I worry about that, but that's the only thing that can, and if we start slipping, like WebKit or have problems, then yes, I'll worry about that. We haven't been there. I mean, the 20 years we've been doing this, we haven't hit that yet. I hope we don't have. I want to retire doing this. <laughs> but actually, people retiring is an interesting group of people, because they are now retiring and spending time working on the kernel for fun. I'm getting a lot of ex-Microsoft people <laughs> Retiring, <laughs> contributing to the kernel. Um, I had a, I had an old neighbor, the place I used to live. My neighbor was an ex IBM mainframe developer. He got into it because he's now anything to do. He's retired. Started contributing to the kernel. It's a nice topic. So, next, there's a question behind you somewhere. Yes, there is. Uh, something. How do you think about uh, Taiwanese companies? Uh, why, many, why many Taiwanese companies doesn't commit to the uh, Linux kernel? And uh, how do you think about the uh, leakage of the Samsung EX fast driver, which is, which is overheard that Samsung is using the was using the fast driver, GPL fast driver, and committed to and and plan to have a plan to as a proprietary driver. Um. First one, time is, so I track companies and I track individuals. I don't track where you live. I just don't know. I'm not that a lot of people thought I used to live in Germany because I had a German email address for many years working for Susan. Um, the SUSE Novell developers in Taiwan are maintainers of some drivers and some subsystems. They're very, very good developers. Um, Joey, or um, Al, kernel developer. These people are good kernel developers. There's a lot of other companies here doing kernel work. Um, some of your wireless chip companies are doing kernel work. They're in the kernel contributors. 
Um, so time limits are doing great. I don't know who are. If there's somebody I need to talk to to do better, please let me know. Um, that's it. So, what's our another question? Oh, the Samsung drone. I don't know about that. <laughs> I haven't seen it. Um, Samsung hasn't sent it to me, uh, so I'm not a lawyer. I'm actually going to go talk to Samsung in a few weeks, so maybe we'll talk about that. I don't know. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is, you have mentioned that a lot of patches get accepted every day, but uh, uh, the, uh, there must also be a lot of patches that's rejected every day. So uh, what, are, what are the common mistakes that, you, uh, that get patches rejected? As in, uh, why do patches get rejected? So that some of the uh, newbie uh, developers here will, will watch out for these common mistakes so they're worthy when they submit, submit patches to the kernel. And my second question is that, as you can see, most of us here are not uh, developers. Some of us are users, some of us are promoters. So, so I'm sure um, uh, there's, there's not just code in the kernel. There are some documentation translations. So in addition to coding, uh, what other stuff can um, people here contribute to the kernel? And how can we contribute to the kernel um, in addition to coding? Thank you. Um, so I'll do it. The first one, um, common mistakes. I gave a whole talk about that last year in Japan. Um, if you go to my GitHub, there's a, another presentation there that go, lists all the problems I saw in two weeks that was sent to me. Um, and there's the documentation, how to, points you to the rules on how to do things. So just read the rules, and if you have questions, ask us. Um, but there's a lot of common mistakes. So we've documented those. So I can get a whole talk on that. Um, oh, the second question. Um, remind me. Uh, my second question yeah. is that in addition to coding. Oh yes, in addition to coding, yes. So what else can you do if you don't aren't a developer? You can run it. You can just build the code, run it, and see if it works for your hardware. If not, let us know. That's a huge thing, because we can't really do a regression test for an operating system due to all the different hardware stuff. So just, just build it, run it. You don't have to be a developer to do that. Um, documentation, if you find spelling mistakes, literally, people gone through and cleaned up spelling mistakes and comments. It, it sounds trivial, and it is, but it makes our code easier to read. The Linux kernel is a very easy code to read, and we want it to be that way. So fix spelling mistakes, it's great. Fix our documentation. We have tech writers that help us all the time. Um, help people for promotion-wise. So Linux.com has a bunch of things you can do to help promote Linux. You can go look at, and they have they have contributions, and they have conferences you can go to, and things like that. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's the best thing. But yeah, we'll take documentation out. White space, people clean up white space. <laughs> <laughs> so your brain, white space is important. Common coding styles is important for your brain. You want to see the brain sees the patterns go away and read things easier. I can only do seven thousand patches, except seven thousand patches a year, because of common coding style. So if, if it's wrong, please fix it.
I wrote 13 this morning. <laughs> um, uh, who do I need to talk to there? I mean, who, talk to me afterwards. I, they need to get better. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on. Anybody here can do white space cleanups for four passes. Um, I don't know what they're doing. I, I, I honestly don't know. <laughs> they should do better. If they rely on Linux. So the thing is, if your company uses these, how they're doing Linux, great. Fine, you rely on them. If you want to control your own destiny and your own company's destiny, then you need to get involved. It's that simple. If, unless you're going to, if you're going to trust Samsung and Intel and IBM and Lenaro are doing the best for your company, that's great. But media tech sounds like they need to, maybe they trust us. Uh, okay. Oh, one more talk. This one, that one, that's it. So uh, you you have over seven thousand signed up by on a page. Do you uh, read each page and try to understand them, or sometimes you just uh, do a very quick quick uh, sentence check? Um, the majority I read, and I, I read it and make sure it looks like it looks correct. Oh, um, I have to. Uh, that's what I do. So that's that's the ones accepted. Um, some I trust from people like Hartley. I pick a lot of Hartley's patches, and I'll just glance up. I'll say, ah, Hartley's good. Because he's been around for a while, right? I trust him that if it's wrong, he'll fix it. And that's a trust relationship there. So, um, but the majority of people, yeah, I read the code. I, that's all I do is read code. That's all David Miller does is read code. Um, it gets boring, it makes us grumpy, it makes us mad sometimes. But um, that's my job. And question up here? Uh, I think that's the last. Did somebody have a question? Um, hey, since you saw that. Anywhere else? Awesome. All right. Uh, how do you decide uh, to, uh, which feature is going to be picked up into the upstream? Um, whatever is just submitted to me. We don't know. That's the thing. We don't have a roadmap. We don't have a time, a roadmap of what's going to be in the next kernel. Just whatever you send me. So if it, you send it to me and it looks good, great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you send it to me and it needs work, I will take it. Uh, so, I mean, two examples. I had people send me out of the blue, brand new drivers, this past couple days. One of them, yeah, looks good. Took it. One of them, no, needs work. You can go back and do it. Um, so yeah, it's just that. Alright, last one. I have one question. Where is A and D? A and D square.